please confirm that you can see the presentation. Hello. Yes, sir. Thank you. All of you may please now mute the mic. Today, I uh, will just briefly revise the last topic that we discussed immediately after the examination. Just for a few minutes, then we shall move on. Also, we have a tutorial today regarding which I shall make some important announcements once we finish the lecture part of the class today. OK, so in the last class, that was one day after the completion of your examination, I took up the topic of Poisson's equation. So what is that thing like? Briefly, it is the following that you have a static distribution of charges. It can be a single charge, which is most convenient to understand. But you can also have a collection of charges, whatever. So if you are far away from that collection of charges, then um, uh, the electric field will just be a function of the radial coordinate, r. So it will go as 1 upon r squared, r cap. OK. Uh, your knowledge of vector calculus will tell you that for such a field, E just a function of R and only directed along the unit radial vector will give a, give a zero curve. Fine. Apart from that, you also are aware of the vector identity that the curl of the gradient of a scalar function is zero. So when you put the two things together, then you can write E as the gradient of a scalar function. And we also put a minus sign, which is mathematically not needed, but it has got an important physical uh, idea to convey. So um, then we go back to Gauss's equation in differential form. Divergence of E is equal to rho by epsilon naught. And in that equation, we substitute the E with the negative gradient of the scalar function. And as such, you will have divergence of the gradient of V is equal to this minus goes to the right hand side, minus rho by epsilon naught. And then divergence of the gradient is the Laplacian operator del squared V. Just shift the bracket here and this shift this bracket here. It will be like del dot del. And so that will be del squared V. OK, so this is Poisson's equation. It applies to a region in space where you have charges and rho stands for the density, spatial density of those charges. But then the electric field, and if the electric field can also be present in a, in, in a region of space where there are no charges, the field could be created somewhere, and then it can travel to a region in space where there are no charges. And as such, if, the, if there is electric field, there will also be a potential. And so in a charge-free region where there are no charges, charge density will be 0. And so this equation will be del squared v is equal to 0. OK, so then br briefly, let's just move on. Um, I, I'll come back to this potential business in due course. So I uh, will curl of E being equal to 0, because E is a, uh, has a form like this. Then by the Stokes theorem, you can also immediately say that the closed path integral of the electric field is also equal to 0, a 0 scalar. And if that is so, then from A to B, coming back, going from a point A to a point B, and then coming back from point B to a point A by another path, not the same path, will be the same. So whatever way you go, I have, I've given this proof uh, mathematically in the supplementary set of notes before your examination, although I've written Y over here, the answer has been given to you mathematically. So you have the answer. So this will be a fixed value. It, it has a fixed value, which means that in a conservative field, it doesn't matter how you go from one point to another point. The path integral of that field will be the same, just like it's just like what is work done. Work done is force dot displacement. So instead of E, if you think of E as the hello, somebody please mute the mic. Yes, thank you. So if you are going from one point to another point, uh, if E is the force, if instead of E, you think of uh, as gravitational force. I'm asking you to carry a heavy load from the ground floor 
of a building, a tall building, let's say your academic building, which unfortunately you have not seen yet, uh, to the top floor. So there are many staircases in the academic block. Uh, so whatever staircase you take, it will not matter. You'll have to do the same amount. I mean, the path integral will be the same. Incidentally, pose.dl is known as work done in mechanics, f.dl. We'll come to that thing today also. So that will be a constant quantity. OK. And so then going by the law, uh, going by the vector integral theorems, by the theorem of gradients, you can always write, uh, I mean, first of all, you can write E as the negative gradient of a scalar function. And that could just be written as the value of the scalar function at the two ends. VB minus VA. Uh, okay, and this is the potential difference. This was the point which I touched upon that potential difference is you can never measure potential exactly at a spot. There will always be an arbitrary additive constant. But when you take the difference of the two potentials, uh, the, uh, uh, potential function at two different points, then the arbitrary constant cancels, and you ju as best you can only measure the potential difference. So you set a point of reference whereby you say that we are measuring our potential with respect to infinity, where we define the potential to have zero value. Okay, and as such, a goes to infinity. Here it will also go to infinity, and uh, this will go to zero. V a which is the point P, A becomes point P, that will also be zero, and this is what you have. Okay, um, and then in the last class, uh, this is just algebra, E dot DL, E just has got, got the radial component, R cap, and uh, that thing dotted with DL, the theta cap and the phi cap components in DL will uh, contribute as, as zero dot product, and you'll simply have this part, this DR, R cap, participating in the integral. And so that is what you have. And so this is the potential of a, a positive charge. I mean, you can see if charge Q is positive, potential will be positive. Charge Q is negative, potential will be negative. Whatever it is, anyway. So, and then if you have a collection of charges, the total potential will be this quantity, Qy by, uh, I mean, charge Qy at position Ri will contribute uh, its own potential at all of them. So these are points we discussed. Principle of superposition we also discussed. Um, so what is it that you have a set of test uh, source charges? I'm sorry. You have a set of source charges. And they will all uh, exert, each source charge will exert its own, own electrostatic field. In the sum of all these electrostatic fields, you place a test charge. The effect that the test charge will feel will be the individual effect of a particular source charge and the test charge alone. Uh, it will not matter how the source charges are also affecting one another. So that is the principle of superposition. Meaning what others are doing among themselves is not a matter of uh, concern for the test charge. OK, so f is equal to QE. So this capital Q is the test charge. So it cancels all throughout. There you have the electric field then. Uh, total electric field is also the vector sum of all the individual electric fields. But then the electric field can be written as a negative gradient of a scalar function. So that you write. And then you can see if you just, so, so to speak, cancel the minus gradient operator, then you'll just have V given as the scalar sum. Uh, of all the potential functions. So this is the point where we ended. I briefly reviewed this because some of these ideas will be important now for us to continue uh, forward. First thing is work done. OK, what is the very basic definition of work done? Follow this point carefully, very carefully. Capital Q is the test charge. OK, and the test charge is feeling the electric field of a source charge. So the source charge exerts, gives, creates an electric field, capital E, vector E. In this electric field, you have placed a test charge. And the test charge, let's say, uh, I mean, it's an attractive field, let us say. Whatever, attractive, repulsive, it doesn't matter. But for the time being, let us say, it's an attractive field. And uh, 
So basically, the force experienced by the test charge will be Q into E. Fine. All right. Now, what is the definition of work done in mechanics? Now, we are just going back to mechanics once again. You follow carefully, particularly regarding this minus sign over here. That is the important point to grasp. Follow carefully. Um, what is work done? Work done is, say, is force that you exert at an object to make it displace through a little, uh, I mean, um, to displace through space. Okay, so the force multiplied by the displacement will give you the work done. So you are exerting, I've, I've asked you, there's a heavy piece of furniture in the room. And I say move it from this one corner to of the room to the other corner. So what will you do? You will apply your muscular force on the piece of furniture, let us say a table. You will push the table across the floor of the room to the other end. So in the process, since you have caused some displacement of the object, you would have had to, the object was static earlier. In the process, you would have had to do some work done. Nothing comes for free in the universe. So uh, you have a, 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 what is work? Work is a form of energy. So you would have had to exert some energy. And uh, so what is the amount of energy that you would have had to calculate? You will say that the energy uh, that you have calculated is the force that you applied on the object multiplied by the displacement through which you have pushed the object from one end of the room to the other. OK. Now here comes the important part over here. What is the force that you are applying on a test charge? I'm asking you, move this test charge uh, that is experiencing the electric field of the source charge against the electric field. Work is always, I mean, uh, I mean, you you will move the object, the charge, the test charge against the electric field. So let's say if it is being attracted towards the test charge, I'm asking, no, no, take it far away. So what will you do? The minimum force that you shall have to apply, the minimum force, the minimum force that you shall have to apply will be equal to the attractive force, but opposite in direction, minus. That is why against the electrostatic force, against the electrostatic force, just think of, about something. I'm asking you move a heavy piece uh, of luggage, a heavy suitcase from the ground floor to the top floor of your house. So what you are doing the work against gravity. Gravity is tending to pull it down, but you will have to apply a force against gravity. That force will come from your muscle power, and you will have to lift the suitcase against gravity and then take it upstairs uh, laboriously. So basically, the force is against the field that is being exerted. And that is why the minimum force that you shall have to apply will be equal to the magnitude of the force with which the field is, uh, with which uh, magnitude of the force that is being exerted on the test charge by the source charge. But since it is against that, you will have to put a minus sign. So be, remember this point carefully. So otherwise, I mean, I could have defined this minus F by, let us say, small f or f1 or whatever so then the work done would be f1 dot dl but i'm using this value only uh, that is the minimum force that you have to apply with the i mean but in the opposite direction against the electrostatic force similarly if uh, you have two charges that are repelling each other a positively charged source charge let us say a positive source charge and, and and a positive test charge then they will be repelling each other and i will say okay now you push it down you force it against like sometimes you can actually see such a thing happen if you have played with balloons filled with helium gas in your childhood uh, the balloon will tend to go upwards against gravity because it's very light, but it's not that gravity is not acting on it. It's just that buoyancy force of the Earth's atmosphere is pushing it upwards. Uh, so that is there. Uh, so what you would try to do is that, so it will be like an effective repulsion. So you would try to push it down. Oh, you can, you would have also seen the same thing in a, uh, in water, a light object, a ping pong ball or something. If you push it down to the bottom of the bucket, it will tend to come up immediately. 
So you'll have to uh, force it down. So like that. So that's that's the kind of work done you have to do. Okay, anyway. So what is the full work done? This is a differential quantity. You'll have to integrate this. So when you integrate dw, it will give you w. On the right-hand side, now let us be careful. You have minus, as you have over here. This is minus. And then uh, f is substituted with q into e. But q is a constant, uh, constant value of the test charge. So that comes out of the integral. And you just have e dot dl. OK, a to b. Uh, from your ground floor to the top of the house uh, in a gravitational field, whatever, a position A to position B. And then going by the theorem of gradients, let us not forget that fact. How did we write this thing? Let us go back to the uh, previous notes. Here we are. Minus E dot DL going from A to B. Minus E dot DL going from A to B is VB minus VA. That is what you have, minus e dot dl. Sorry, here we are. Minus e dot dl. Q is there. Then minus e dot dl going from a to b will give you vb minus va. And so when b is at your general position r, you, these are the two limits, but you can be anywhere, not exactly at the limit. So we are just then generalizing this argument. b is uh, at r. And A is made to go to infinity. If A go, goes to infinity, we have already defined that at infinity, potential is 0. And so V infinity will be equal to 0. So V infinity is equal to 0. Therefore, what are you left with? W is equal to Q into V at the position, spatial position R. Potential. So this actually gives you a definition also somewhat of the potential. I mean, there's a little bit of a problem with all this energy work or business in terms of definition. Uh, what is it? In school, we study, define energy. Energy is, we say that energy is the capacity to do work. OK, fine. Then, but what is work? Work is a form of energy. OK, so then you put the two statements together. Then it comes out to be energy is the capacity to do some form of energy. So you get into a logical cycle over there. I mean, there's no, I mean, these are things that we study in, in school naively. But the fact is that what is energy? You, 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 to understand that, you actually have to go back to Newton's second law which I have supplied to you in uh, the supplementary notes, whereby you say that what it, what energy is, energy is actually the conserved quantity that comes out of Newton's second law when you integrate it. Uh, so that's why energy is important. It's a conserved quantity. But that's the most general thing you can say about energy. Otherwise, energy is uh, uh, capacity to do work, and work is a form of energy. These definitions will put you in a logical bind. And same applies to potential. I mean, what is potential? Well, you really can't say uh, what is. You just say potential is a scalar function in a conservative system. If your uh, uh, system is a conservative system, as you have over here, and conservative systems are also irrotational system, then you can represent that vector uh, field with the potential function. That's a mathematical statement. How do you kind of get a physical feel for the potential function that you have introduced? This is a scalar function, all right. So here's the physical uh, statement about a potential function. Poten what is potential? Here you have is the work done per unit charge. Uh, w is equal to Q into V. Uh, for instance, you know that in elect uh, when you're working with an electron, there is an, a unit called electron volt. The Q over there becomes E, the charge of the electron. So one electron, well, not one electron, one electron by ignoring the minus sign, if you want, one electron electron charge or magnitude value, uh, uh, absolute value of the electron charge into a potential function gives you the energy uh, as electro in electron volt unit. In the atomic domain, that's the natural unit to work with. Uh, here, 
uh, we are talking about a general uh, statement uh, that charge into potential will give you work. So what is work? If the charge has got a unit value, one coulomb, let us say, then that will be the work done. Potential will can then be interpreted as the work done. And there is something else to uh, look at. If you look at this formula, uh, this formula, and I've written something here, compare with the electric field, force per unit charge. And this is work done per unit charge. So if this is work done per unit charge, and this is force per unit charge, then uh, electric field, you can see that this equation over here, just try to follow. This equation over here is one spatial dimension higher than the force equation below. The work done equation is one spatial dimension higher than the force equation. I hope you are able to understand that. So if I multiply this equation by a spatial dimension, f dot dl, let us say, I'll get w. And e dot dl, I'll get v. Right. That will also give you a unit of the electric field. A unit of the electric field, e dot dl, will give you v. Therefore, the unit of the electric field can be written as Volt, the unit of the potential. We'll work on these things later in tutorials. Today we have a tutorial also. We'll discuss these things later in the tutorial. But what I'm saying is that if you give the unit of volts to this thing, then E can be defined in terms of the uh, with the units. Volt per meter. I hope you are able to understand that. Otherwise, some of you also write the unit Newton per coulomb. That's also in use. But volt per meter is the one that is universally accepted upon. Okay, so I will just stop the sharing. I'll just go to the supplementary notes to touch upon a few points regarding potential and stuff. And then we will, I, I'll also have some discussion regarding the tutorial before I move on. So please just bear with me. Please just bear with me. Can you please confirm that you can see this thing, the presentation? One of you, please confirm. Yes, I did. Thank you. Please mute your mic. Let us see. This is the supplementary set of notes which are there with you. I have discussed this thing. There's one just a small point to take up here. Uh, that is about Poisson's equation. Poisson's equation. Uh, I mean, I, I touched upon this point. Uh, I mean, the, the other things I have already discussed uh, the last few pages. It's just I mean, these are just uh, things that came up in the course of discussion in the previous years. So I created a set of supplementary notes. Normally, if we had had a physical class, I mean, in, at, attended in person, I would have discussed these things in front of me on the board route without getting into the trouble of writing notes separately. Okay, uh, there, there's just, just this point. Although I touched upon it, I'll just stress this thing once again. You notice that this equation, di curl of E or diver is equal to zero, or divergence of E is equal to my, uh, I'm sorry, rho by epsilon naught, all these equations, these equations are first order differential equations. Divergence of E is equal to rho by epsilon naught, or curl of E is equal to zero. But when you go to the potential formalism, E is the negative gradient of a scalar function. I mentioned this thing, but today I thought I'd just uh, discuss this point in some more detail. In the last class, I, I referred to this, this issue. Um, when you, instead of working with the electric field, you want to work with the potential. In that case, you immediately realize that if you want to work with V, not E, then you, are, you will have to work with del squared V. This is the Laplacian operator, which is a second order differential operator. Can you just excuse me for a minute, please? Thank you. This is a second order differential equation. Now, why is this thing happening? You say, what, uh, what, is, the, what is the point? I mean, uh, it's difficult enough to work with a first order differential equation, particularly using, let us say, curvilinear coordinates and stuff like that. Um, but 
I mean, if you go to the second order, it makes your mathematical task even more difficult. Yes, indeed. Here's the answer. E is a vector quantity, whereas V is a scalar quantity. And if E is a vector quantity, as such, it will have both magnitude and direction. So two points of information you shall always have to keep track of. Whereas the potential has only magnitude, one point of information. But we are doing mathematics, and mathematics is ruthlessly precise. You can't avoid the trouble of working with a field, a vector field, which requires two points of information to be supplied all the time, and say that I want to go to a scalar field and not, be, not pay the price for that. What is the price? That when you're working with a vector field, which requires two points of information, you were working with a first order differential equation. As soon as you go into an equivalent field in terms of the potential, which has got only one uh, point of information, which is the magnitude, immediately the price that you pay for this little convenience is that you have to work with a second order differential equation. So that is what it is. Hence, V requires a second order differential equation because uh, you are dealing with a magnitude, whereas E needs only the first order. So basically, there is a price to be paid. Nature is ruthless, and mathematics expresses nature in most precise terms so there is no avoiding of the trouble but nevertheless people work with the potential function what is the advantage the advantage is this that you don't have to worry about this direction business direction always having to keep track of a direction particularly in a vector field that is varying in its direction can be a bit of a bother so it's always safer more convenient to go to the scalar formalism even though you have to work with a second order differential equation. And the last point in the supplementary note that I shall refer to is that you notice, I mean, this point I also touched upon, that the left hand side is a potential difference. Once again, I stress this fact, which you would have studied in school, I'm sure, is that every time you would have st studied all these electricity and circuit kind of things, you were always told that we were measuring potential difference and not the potential function in itself that is the thing so be it understood that it is quite natural and as you can see it is coming out of the theorem of gradients so that is what it is this, this theorem of gradients will give you this thing okay so th that was the one little point from the supplementary set of notes the rest of the notes uh, we have covered already so i wouldn't want to spend further time on this thing i'd now like to get on to a new topic but before that I shall make a brief announcement. I'm stopping the sharing of this thing, by the way. I shall make a brief, I'm to make a brief announcement now regarding our tutorial today. Today we have a tutorial. I hope all of you are listening attentively. Today we have a tutorial at 2 p.m., 2 to 3 p.m. Um, we will have a lot of things to discuss. You finished in your examination, you finished your examination last week. So in the tutorial today, we shall discuss the solution of uh, those exam uh, examination questions. So you were given the examination question. So we shall discuss the solution of the examination. And uh, you should assure yourselves that, uh, I mean, I hope that you have kept track of all the questions you atten uh, attempted. And uh, you have kept track of the questions you have attempted and you have the answers with you. So you should tally whether you have got the right answer to a particular question or not. We shall not discuss the marking scheme. Once the evaluation starts, Professor Mukesh Tiwari and I, we shall mutually decide, I mean, jointly decide what the marking scheme is going to be like. Today, we shall just discuss the solutions. And in due course of time, hopefully by sometime by the end of next week, not this week, by the end of next week, hopefully, you should be uh, you should get your scores also so that is one thing that we shall discuss in the tutorial both the parts part a and part b and apart from that we shall also discuss a tutorial sheet where we will take up the problems we have just i mean the uh, the uh, the potential and work done business okay so with that, we shall now move on to the new topic. Can you please just confirm that you can see the new presentation? Please just confirm. Hello.
Hello, can any one of you please confirm that you can see the new presentation? Yes, yes sir. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. You please mute your mic. I shall now begin the discussion so on this new topic. But uh, to this, uh, in the tutorial today, we shall not uh, take up these things in the problems. Okay. So we will now take up electrostatic boundary conditions. So electrostat electric field due to charged conductors. This is from your textbook, David Griffiths. Uh, so I marked the section up here also, 2.3.5. Let us try to see how is it like. First, let us try to understand what is going on here. Here is a sheet, let us say a copper sheet or whatever, very good conductor. Copper is a very good conductor. And this sheet is idealized to extend to infinity in both directions. So it's, it's a rectangular sheet, but you can say that the rectangular sheet can be extended in all four directions. By both directions, I mean uh, both coordinates, x coordinate and y coordinate. So plus x direction, minus x direction, plus y direction, minus y direction. So the coordinate plane, the x, y coordinate, the, the, the rectangular sheet uh, is progressing towards infinity on the x, y coordinate plane. Okay. And uh, the sheet contains charges. It's a thin copper sheet, let us say, contains charges. And you know the purpose of charges. What do they do? The purpose of charges is to throw electric field lines going up and going down. That is what it is. In the last class, I discussed this point that if you have a plane full of charges and the charges have constant surface density sigma, then the electric fields will uh, field lines will come just like a bed of arrows straight up but then they will also be, it will also go down in the opposite direction downward direction so the electric field lines will be like a bed of nails or bed of arrows all straight up and all straight down from this sheet uh, we discussed this point in the uh, in the last class uh, and what is the value of the electric field, strength of the electric field? Uh, I'm writing it over here, ES1. S as in surface, conducting surface, electric field through an uh, uncharged conducting surface is continuous. I've written this statement. I will come to the meaning of this statement shortly. So you have got surface charges, and the surface charges are throwing out electric field upwards and downwards. The S over here signifies the word surface. So ES1 is, stands for the field lines that are going up. And ES2 stands for the field lines that are going down. Sigma y twice epsilon naught n cap upwards and sigma y twice epsilon naught n cap minus n cap going downward. You'll say, what is this n cap business? N as in normal. These field lines are normal to the normal meaning perpendicular normal to the surface. You said, why haven't I written Z or X or Y or all that? I said, no, well, I mean, my answer will be no. I mean, the, field, the sheet doesn't always in general have to align itself with uh, the XY plane or the YZ plane or the ZX plane. It can be also inclined. It can be an inclined plane to the XY plane. So then in that case, it is safer to write things more generally in terms of a normal vector N instead of writing Z cap or X cap or Y cap and things like that. So that's why I've written n cap, normal unit vector. OK, now there is, so the, the, this ES1 and ES2, they are coming out due to charges that are residing on this infinite sheet, infinitely long sheet, infinite both ways along the x and uh, y directions. Now there is another electric field coming. This is E. as drawn by this inclined path coming from outside. What do you mean by outside? Let's say some charges are there somewhere far away, not on the sheet. Somewhere far down, somewhere you have charges. And these charges are throwing electric fields going up like this in this direction. So it's going up like that. Charges will throw electric field. So some charge from outside somewhere from outside, they have thrown this electric field. And it can, it doesn't always have to have a proper perpendicular path or uh, uh, this path, parallel path, whatever, it can pierce this charge full 
or sorry, plane full of charges at an angle E, at, at, at an angle, and so this is, I don't know, um, pierce it obliquely, sorry, pierce it obliquely and go like that. So what you do is that you decompose this external electric field. By external, I mean that the electric field has got has come from source charges far outside, far away from the sheet. So the, the, these electric fields, ES1 and ES2, are due to charges on this sheet. But this E is coming from charges that are far away. So it spears this electric field. Uh, it, Here's this plane full of charges, and uh, I have now decomposed it into two components. One is a perpendicular component, E perpendicular. This is the symbol of perpendicular, and E parallel. Parallel, this is the symbol of parallel. It is aligned with the electric field. It is lying on, the elect uh, lying on this plane, and this is perpendicular to the plane. Okay. Now, what is the total perpendicular electric field above the sheet, let us see, E perpendicular above will be the perpendicular component due to the external field as in here and the perpendicular electric field due to the charges on the sheet as in here. So this plus this will give you E perpendicular above, E perpendicular this one plus E S one going up like that. And uh, what about below? Here is something important. Notice that above the plane, both the field lines are in the same direction. Both are going away. But here, below the plane, this field line, this external field line is going in, and the internal field line is going out. So this internal charges, the internal charges over here, have created a field that is going down away from this plane, whereas this thing can be extended inside within this thing, and it will look like that it is this perpendicular component would look like that it's like an arrow coming from outside and drilling through. So here the two field lines are opposite to each other, and that oppositeness is captured by the minus sign, but we'll see about that. So the total electric field below, E perpendicular below, is equal to this plus this ES2. I've written the plus over here, but you will say, why not minus? I said, yes, it's actually minus, but the minus is captured here already with the minus end cap. So basically ES2 already has a minus sign built into it. It's inbuilt in ES2. So that is how it is. So basically if E perpendicular this and ES2 were to have the same magnitude, then the total perpendicular component below the sheet would have been equal to zero. And that is actually what happens in many cases. We shall talk about that thing later. Let's see what we make of these two things. Now what I will do is that I will see what is the difference between the total perpendicular electric component above the sheet and the total perpendicular component below the sheet. So E perpendicular above will be E perpendicular plus ES1, which is sigma by twice epsilon naught n cap, minus E perpendicular below, which is equal to minus here. This is E perpendicular. And then ES2. ES2 is minus sigma by twice epsilon naught n cap. OK. Now if you look at this thing, this thing and this thing, E perpendicular and E perpendicular will cancel because there's a minus sign over here. But this thing and this thing will not cancel. Why not? Because minus and minus will make it plus. And so basically this thing will be sigma by twice epsilon naught plus sigma by twice epsilon naught n cap, which is sigma by epsilon naught n cap. That's the normal component. Uh, that is the point that I stated about. It's a non-zero difference. What is electric field through an uncharged, uncharged conducting surface is continuous. If it is charged, follow carefully, then you'll have these black dots on the plane. And the total perpendicular component above the plane and below the plane will have a non-zero difference. If the plane were to be uncharged, then there would have been no charges on the plane, and therefore the charge density would have been equal to zero. Sigma would have been equal to zero. Surface charge density would have been equal to zero. So E perpendicular above minus E perpendicular below would have been equal to zero. 
which is to say that for an uncharged plane there will be no contribution to the electric field perpendicular component of the electric field as it is drilling through the, this thing but if there are charges in this on this plane even as this electric field is going it will receive a boost to its strength as it emerges from the outer side so for a charged conducting surface that difference is sigma by epsilon naught so basically what am i saying i am saying that whatever be the value of the field below will get an addition of sigma by epsilon naught n cap as it comes out to the other side if there are charges on this surface but if there are no charges then on the surface then charge density will be zero and if charge density will be zero then uh, sigma will be equal to zero and e perpendicular above minus e perpendicular below uh, will be equal to zero so let us now look at these two statements first is electric field through an uncharged conducting surface is continuous what do i mean by continuous meaning that it doesn't receive a sudden extra boost from somewhere it's smoothly changing from below to above but the normal component changes discontinuously through a charged conducting surface if it is uncharged it will smoothly change through the zero value but if it is charged then the normal component will change discontinuously what do i mean by that suppose the e perpendicular component is zero below suddenly above it will become sigma by epsilon naught n cap this point will be very important when we talk about conductors surface charges on conductors uh, conductors have got fairly interesting properties uh, we shall look at that soon enough now but uh, there is also something else to be looked at we have talked about the perpendicular component what about the parallel component the parallel component is this let us see uh, we, we are talking about electrostatic boundary condi conditions incidentally here I've written something electrostatic boundary conditions what do i mean by boundary conditions so this sheet is like a boundary below there is a field it's meeting this wall and then a ceiling let us say not a wall meeting the ceiling and then above the ceiling is leave uh, the sea line is leaving the ceiling so that sheet is like a boundary between two zones separating two zones the below zone and the above zone are separated from each other by this boundary sheet so that's why what is the condition at that boundary the condition at that boundary is that if there are no charges on uh, on this boundary then the field below and above will change smoothly but if there are charges on this boundary then the field above and below will change discontinuously and therefore there will be a non zero difference between the two fields so that's why we are talking about boundary conditions but so far we have talked about the boundary condition to the perpendicular component or the normal component with n cap as you can see here what about the parallel component this one let us see now this is how we shall go again it's the boundary condition on the parallel component as you can see immediately you can uh, you have this thing that you're working with the vector electric field and so you always have to worry about what is happening in this one direction or the other if you had worked with a scalar field you would not have to worry about all this direction business uh, so i hope that conveys the importance of the scalar formalism anyway let's see uh, curl of e is equal to zero if curl of e is equal to zero then the closed path integral of the electric field is also equal to zero we have discussed this thing so many times so the closed path integral is zero now here let us do something uh, here's the sheet this same sheet charge uh, full of charges and extended to infinity in all four directions so here's that sheet on this sheet you have drawn a small loop a square loop a loop doesn't always have to be a circular loop it just has to close upon itself that is what it is the geometrical shape does not matter so we have drawn a square loop of width l and 
hyped epsilon where epsilon is very small okay let us now look at the parallel component because we have to do the e dot dl we are just going to apply this parallel component over here let us see the parallel component is e parallel dot dl or dot l will give you e parallel above uh, i'm sorry i should have discussed something else also this square loop is half of the square loop is sticking above the plane and half of the square loop is sticking below the plane this dotted line represents the portion of the plane through which the this point of the loop and this point of the loop is intersecting the plane so from this point and this point the top part of the so it's just like the loop is half of the square loop is sticking above the uh, I mean, can be is visible above the plane and the other half is below the plane like that it is okay so e perpendicular above so i'm sorry e parallel above e parallel above is in this direction you can see i have drawn this field in this direction going from left to right i hope you are clear on that point dot product e parallel above dot dl but dl is just this whole length so i have taken the dot product there e parallel above into l what is the definition of a dot product first vector into second vector sorry magnitude of the first vector into the magnitude of the second vector into cosine of the angle track between the two vectors but e parallel is going from left to right l is also going from left to right therefore the angle trapped between the tape the two is zero degrees cos of zero degree is one so e parallel above into l is equal to vector is e parallel above into l into cos zero it is equal to one plus now let's see what about this part so you have to do the full path integral the electric field the parallel component of the electric field is only going from the left to the right so the first path this left to right track has given you this term then it's turning and the the, the path is turning at this point and is going down but the electric field is still going from left to right now between the two of them there's 90 degree angle if there is a 90 degree angle between the two of them then e parallel above or whatever it is you want to call it, and you make this thing go to zero epsilon is going to zero you can make this thing as small as possible so e parallel dot this path will be zero because vector vector uh, that path will be zero because there's a 90 degree angle between the two what did i say about the dot product magnitude of first vector times magnitude of second vector times co cosine of the angle between the two and cosine of the angle between the two is uh, sorry angle between the two is 90 degrees therefore cosine 90 degree will be zero so this path does not contribute anything to the loop integral now what about the bottom track follow very carefully everybody this thing is going in the opposite direction but the electric field parallel component is still going from left to right whereas the path is going from the right to the left what shall you write for the dot product between the two magnitude of the first vector which is the electric parallel component of the electric vector e parallel below this part is sticking below the plane times the magnitude of the second vector which is l times cosine of the angle between the two and what is the angle between the two the angle between the two is 180 degrees the parallel component is going from left to right whereas the path is going from displacement is going from right to left so between the two of them is 180 degrees and cos zero degrees one cos 90 degrees zero cos 180 degree is minus one and again cos 270 degree incidentally is zero so cos of 180 degree will be minus one and that minus has come over here and after that you have to go back to where you started from so again it's a perpendicular path but the field is going from left to right so the two things are perpendicular to each other and in any case epsilon is also going to zero so when you consider all that the dot product of the parallel component of the electric field and this perpendicular track going above from bottom to top will again contribute a zero outcome 
Why? Because there will be again that cosine 90 degree business between the two of them. So basically now you just have E parallel above into L plus E parallel below into minus L is equal to zero. Cancel the L on both sides. So basically it will be E parallel above minus E parallel below is equal to zero. Therefore E parallel above is equal to E parallel below. So regardless of whether you have charges on this plane or not, it doesn't matter. The parallel component just above this field, infinitesimally above this field and infinitesimally below this field. Why infinitesimal? Because I'm saying epsilon is going to zero. Ep epsilon is the thickness of this loop, height of this loop. Make that thing go to zero. So little above and little below, infinitesimally, as close as you can make it, but not exactly overlapping. Whatever be it, regardless of whether you have charges on this plane or not, they will be the same. However, if there are charges on this plane, the perpendicular component, the normal component, will change discontinuously. Will, uh, the normal component will get a contribution from this plane. That is the important conclusion. Of course, if the plane is charge neutral, there are no charges, net charges on the plane, then there will be no contribution. It's just like a charge neutral plane. Charge neutral plane meaning if it's a copper sheet, you touch it, you don't feel a shock. But if it's containing net positive charge, let us say you touch it, you'll feel a shock. That is what I mean. Uh, so in the latter case, if you have charges, uh, those charges will make the perpendicular component undergo a non-zero sudden shock. Sigma by epsilon not n cap. Shocking difference, a sudden, sudden jacked up value. Okay, uh, this is just this last one point. I said that, I mean, you would have had to worry, you have, you, have, you have had to worry about this perpendicular component, parallel component, all that stuff. If only you were working with a potential function, things would have been so much easier. How so? Don't have to worry about direction and stuff. Here's the plane, full of charges or whatever. There's a little displacement above the plane and there's a little displacement below the plane. The displacement, um, uh, the position, above is B and position below is A, they're very close to each other. What is the difference between these two uh, uh, this, uh, points, uh, a potential VB minus VA, but VB minus VA is minus E dot DL, A to B. Okay, but when you make A go to B, VB is V above and VA is V below. Um, when you make A go to B, then these two things will get close to each other. So the scalar function will not change. The scalar function will remain fixed. Why do you think the scalar function will not change? Can anybody give me the answer or think about the answer? I will tell you what the answer is. Hmm? You can't give the answer because it's a constant electric field that is being contributed over here constant electric field e is equal to the negative gradient of a scalar function. Anyway, so you can think about it, uh, come to the answer by yourself also. Let us now move on to a new topic, that of conductors. This is going to be a long topic. We will spend quite a few lecture periods on this thing and it has got important electrostatic properties to discuss, conductors as well as insulators later. What is the major difference between conductors and insulators? Let us see. Conductors conduct and insulators insulate. But those are very commonplace English words that I am using. Conductors conduct, insulators insulate. What is the physical reason for conduction and what is the physical reason for insulation? What is insulation? Insulation meaning it will not allow charges to pass through. For instance, if you have a live copper wire, uh, I mean a copper wire, through which current is passing, if the wire does not have any insulation coating, like, you know, you have all this uh, colored coating material, uh, green, red, black, if you don't have all that coating material, if the wire is exposed, then if you touch that wire, you'll feel a shock. But if the wire is coated under that insulate, coated inside that, ins coated with that insulating material. So current may be flowing through the wire inside, but if you touch that material, uh, coat, coated 
the coating material outside, you will not feel the current. What is the purpose of that coating material? It is not allowing current to pass through. So basically, there must be something that causes current to pass through conductors and current is not allowed to pass through insulators. There must be something happening physically speaking. So you have to give a physical description of what is happening. So what makes conductors conduct? Very simple, short answer. Possess free charges. Let us, let me just uh, give you a simple example. Um, like, you know, in, uh, in the air that you have, these days it's become very hot and humid and there is not much of a breeze. So, uh, if you sit within closed walls, you'll feel very uncomfortable. To create some comfort, what will you do? You will close the, uh, you'll open the window, let some breeze come in, you will uh, turn on the fan, and the fan will cause the air, what is breeze? Breeze is just the movement of air molecules. The fan will create some artificial breeze coming from the top of your ceiling down bottom uh, down below to where you are seated. Uh, the, if you open the window, uh, there will be a breeze across the room. So basically the air molecules are traveling. Right. Why are the air molecules traveling? Because they are free to travel. Nothing is holding them. It's not like uh, air molecules also experience gravity. That is true. Anything that has got mass will experience gravity. You can very well say, Okay, if the air molecules experience gravity, then how is it that they're moving so freely? Incidentally, you can, uh, just like a, a while ago I asked you one question, I'm asking you another question that you can think about and maybe sometime uh, at your convenience, if you have come to an answer, you can give me the answer. The question is this. If you hold an object in your hand, your mobile phone or your pen or whatever, and you let go of that object, will you see happening? It will fall down to the ground. So everything that has got mass experiences gravity and the effect of gravity is to pull that thing towards the ground, towards the center of the earth actually. I mean the, the direction of the ground is in the direction of the center of the earth. So any object that has got mass must fall under gravity and get down to as low a position as possible. If the ground were not to have been there, your object would have fallen straight down to the center of the earth. But that does not happen. There is solid ground under your feet. Um, if that is so, why is, is it that air molecules don't uh, fall to the ground? They are merrily moving around freely. I'm saying freely in the context of the word free that I've written over here, possess free charges. They're moving around merrily. They should also fall, they have mass. Air is made up of nitrogen and oxygen. Uh, nitrogen has got some mass, uh, nitrogen molecule, N2, 28 atomic mass unit. And one atomic mass unit is the mass of a proton. So 28 times the mass of a proton. And similarly, oxygen, O2, 16 into 16 oxygen molecule, 32 atomic mass unit. Uh, 32 times the mass of a proton. So, if they have masses, they should be falling down. And you should not have had such a tall atmosphere. It's just full of air molecules all the way up. So, why are, is, why are the air molecules not coming down? So, you can think of that answer. And why are they moving freely? Other objects, objects that you have in your hand, hold in your hand, they are not moving around freely. So, it is that conductors have something like the air molecules that are moving freely in your room. They have free charges. Let me discuss this thing. And why did I talk about, I mean, when I talked about air, you, I hope you know that air is a fundamentally a gas. It's a gas that is a mixture of two uh, kinds of gases, predominantly two kinds of gases, nearly 20% oxygen and nearly 80% nitrogen, both in the molecular form. Molecular nitrogen gas, molecular oxygen gas. 
nearly 80% and nearly 20%. Not exactly. There's a little bit of difference and that extra little bit of difference is filled up with carbon dioxide and the noble gases, some helium, methane, little gases in small amount, other, other gases in small amount. Um, you can very well see, by the way, that carbon dioxide doesn't have percentage-wise, it doesn't have a, a very high presence in the Earth's atmosphere. And yet, if a little increase of carbon dioxide happens, then the Earth's uh, balance, greenhouse balance, will be severely affected. Uh, so that's why you say that there should be, these days, there's in, there are environmental environmental concerns that we should not emit too much carbon dioxide. Anyway, we'll have to keep that aside. Um, so let us think of a conductor. Why does a conductor conduct? A conductor conducts because it has got free charges. Very simple thing. Why does an insulator not conduct? An insulator insulates because it does not possess free charges. Let us now discuss this free charges business. Consider a a good conductor like copper it's considered to be a standard good conductor there are other good conductors also incidentally silver gold they are all very good conductors except that they are not very cheap copper comes at a, a very low cost therefore copper is used while aluminium also copper is used widely as a standard conductor um, so copper is a metal Incidentally, good conductors are usually metal. I'm saying usually, not always, but usually metal. Copper is a good conductor. What happens inside copper that gives this good uh, property, this property of good conductivity? Let us try to see that. Copper is made up of, uh, uh, I've given you a wire of copper or a block of copper, whatever. What is it made of? It is made up of copper atoms. Now, this is a metal. Metals tend to form a well-ordered crystalline structure. And so these copper atoms will tend to get together and form a neat array of crystalline structure. These things are not really seriously needed for your electrostatic courses, but I think you should still have some physical insight. That's why I'm discussing it. So um, copper has got some... I mean, what is a copper atom made of? Made up of, it is made up of a central positive charge, as in the nucleus, and some electrons outside in the atom. Now, when two copper atoms form a bond to get into some sort of an ordered structure, and then successively this kind of a bonding business is replicated, how does a bond form? Two copper atoms have come together, they form some kind of a bond, metallic bond. And as a result, because of this formation of the bond, an electron is given out. Actually, more, not one electron, two to three electrons are given out uh, in the case of copper. And so what do these electrons do? If you had, were uh, an electron in a copper atom, and the copper atom was completely isolated from the rest of the atoms, then the electron would have been comfortable being a part of the atom, would have comfortably been a part of the atom. But when one copper atom gets close to another copper atom, they form a metallic bond to get into an ordered crystalline structure. Remember, there is a tendency in nature to reduce energy, to reduce energy. And this getting into an ordered crystalline structure helps in the reduction of that energy, total energy. So that is how it is. So getting into an ordered crystalline structure helps in the reduction of the energy. So, um, so when two copper atoms get close to each other, they will form a bond. But this bonding process will release electrons from each atom. And what will these electrons do? Now they have been thrown out of the, their comfort zone of the copper atom. They will think of this thing carefully, try to understand this point carefully. I have given you a block of copper, metal, copper metal block. There are atoms that are neatly arrayed inside in, an, in a lattice. But the formation of the lattice has come at the cost of the electron being thrown out of the atom. Where will these electrons go? These electrons thereafter 
keep drifting through this ordered lattice of copper ions. The, the, uh, the atoms are no longer atoms because they are no longer charge neutral. I mean, they have become, they have lost their electron and they have uh, formed this ion. I mean, I mean, they have formed bonding. And so these electrons are thereafter now free to move around, drifting through this entire lattice grid. Just like, let us say, um, think of this thing. There is a house building under construction. I hope you have seen uh, what a building under construction looks like. You have the floor, you have the ceiling, and then you have the pillars. The walls haven't been built yet, right? And if you were a human being walking through those uh, on, 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 on a particular floor, you could imagine yourself there are right then and there to be like the electron. You are the electron and the atoms I mean, the pillars are like the bonds between atoms, and the atoms are where the bonds are ending, the pillars are ending. So the electron is like that. So it goes through this cubic kind of a lattice or whatever. It doesn't have to be cubic, whatever, ordered lattice through which the electron is drifting. And the more electrons there are, free electrons, better will be the conductivity property. In the case of copper, I hope you have not forgotten your school chemistry. Copper has got a valency of two or three, plus two, two plus, three plus, those things. Q plus and Q prick. So in the process of forming this lattice structure, these copper atoms throw out a reasonably large number of electrons. Each atom may contribute uh, more than two electrons, not just one. So that's why there is a large number of free charges drifting inside this uh, free charges, uh, drift, charges freely drifting inside this copper lattice. Now what happens when you apply a potential difference? When you apply a potential difference, these charges will start moving under that potential difference. And how will you apply a potential difference? On a copper wire, let us say, by applying, uh, in, uh, connecting the two ends of the copper wire to the two terminals of a battery. The battery will create immediately a potential difference along the wire and the free charges in that wire will start moving. Free charges as in electron. A few points to consider, two points I shall uh, discuss now. What this free part and this, this the potential difference part. Incidentally, uh, talking of this free part, in technical terms, the collection of electrons inside these conductors are called electron gas free electron gas free electron gas you know what a gas is like just a while ago I, that's the reason why i discussed the earth's atmosphere uh, in the earth's atmosphere you have free oxygen and nitrogen molecular gas and they can move around freely a little bit of drift happens uh, the, the particles will move a little temperature difference happens, hot air will start rising. You would have studied this thing in school geography, hot air rises, cold air comes down, cool air comes down. So the electrons are like that now, free gas, free uh, particle. In the case of insulators, now you follow this point carefully. I have just discussed conductors. What happens in the case of insulators? In the case of insulators, the electrons that are outermost in the atom, in the case of copper, you have two or three electrons that are outermost in the atom. When copper atoms form a bond, these electrons are thrown out and they have become free. The parent atom has said, get out of my house. Right. So you go out of the house as an electron and you keep drifting outside the world like a vagabond freely, nobody to stop you. You can go anywhere you want to. Not, not exactly anywhere you want to, I'll come to that point. But in the case of an insulator, when the atoms in an insulator form a bond, there is no such business as giving up electrons to form a stronger bond. That's why there are no free electrons in an insulator and an insulator does not conduct. But a conductor conducts because it possesses free charges. But then, as I said, the freedom is not complete. The freedom is restricted to a certain end. It's not total absolute freedom. What do I mean by that? By that I mean that the electrons are free to move or drift around within the lattice structure of the copper uh, material, block or wire or whatever. But they're not free to move out of that block. As much as, let us say, you are free. 
to travel anywhere within your country, India. If you are in India, you can travel anywhere within India. From one state to another, you can travel. I mean, I'm, not, I'm talking about the times when there were no COVID restrictions. So you can, nobody will stop you if you go from Gujarat to Maharashtra or Rajasthan or Madhya Pradesh. Nobody will stop you. But you're not, so you're like an electron. So if India is like that copper block, you are an electron, you can travel anywhere within that uh, system. But you're not free to move out of uh, India. If you go and try to cross the border into Pakistan or China, there will be trouble. And so there will be restrictions. So that is the thing. So in the case of a good conductor also, the electrons are free to move around as much as they want to or they can within the material. But they can't uh, vaporize, so to speak, outside the material. I use the word vaporize pointedly. It's just like, you know, you have water surface. The water molecules trapped within that surface also move around freely. But then the water molecules can also vaporize out of that puddle of water. And soon enough, you'll see that the puddle has dried up and everything has left. No such thing happens in the case of a conductor. The electrons are free to move within, but uh, they don't come out of the conductor. Okay, so that is the free charge part. What about the potential part? I said that you apply a potential difference. If you do not have a potential difference, things are static, they will not move. Just consider your tabletop. I hope, I mean, right now, I believe you're listening to this lecture in front of your computer, laptop, whatever, which is placed on a tabletop. The objects on your tabletop are static. They are not moving one way or the other. But as soon as you lift your table in one direction, at, at one end, then there will be an inclined surface. So any object on the tabletop will immediately feel a potential difference. And it will start to move from the top part to the bottom part. So that is the potential difference. In the case, I've just given you a mechanical example. I told you in the, uh, in the early stages, because a lot of mechanics, the same principle applies over here also in the case of a conductor. In the case of a conductor, the free charges, namely electrons, will immediately start if you do not apply a potential dif difference across the length of a wire. The charges will just be moving haphazardly. Or maybe they will not even move. I mean, nobody wants to move around for no reason. So they will, or even if they do, they will be moving haphazardly. So there will be no sense of a net direction. But as soon as you apply a potential difference throughout the battery, immediately all the charges will start marching in an ordered direction from one end of the wire to the other. And as such, you will have a net movement of charges. Not, no longer haphazard, it's just like soldiers marching in formation. And you will see a perfect uh, body of objects, particles of human beings moving. However, I mean, so that's, that's, that's what happens under a potential difference it will start moving, just like objects, material objects on your tabletop. If you lift the table at one end, we'll start moving under the potential difference. That said, I'll make one important distinction, a uh, conventional point. It is that when we say current, we do not refer to the movement of, posit uh, movement of negative charges. Electrons are negatively charged particles. Do not forget that fact. But when I say current, I'm referring to the movement of positive charges. But in a copper wire, the positive charges are frozen in space. They are frozen in, in the lattice. It's only the negative charges that move. So what do you say? That although in, in reality it is the electrons that are moving, I am making it and look like an equivalent movement of positive charges in the opposite direction. That is how you map it, translate it. So a conductor conducts charges, conducts current. What is current? Current is the movement of charges. What charges move in a good metallic conductor? Electrons. But current should not be seen as the movement of a bunch of electrons, but should be seen as the movement of a, a whole collection of uh, electrons. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, a whole collection of equivalent positive charges. I'm sorry, equivalent positive charges in the opposite direction. That you have to be very clear about, particularly when you're solving problems. OK, certain properties of conductors I'll just touch upon. Electric field inside a conductor is always 0. Remember that thing. 
electric field inside a conductor is always zero. Now you'll ask me why? What is the answer? I'll come to that answer. We don't have time today. But I'll just touch on the second point that if electric field inside a conductor is always zero, then charge inside a charge density inside a conductor must also be zero. This is very surprising. How is it so? You say conductor is full of charges, and then I'm saying charge density inside a conductor is always zero. How is charge density is equal to zero? By Gauss's law, divergence of E is equal to zero. Electric field is zero. This is the physical input. I'll discuss this thing in detail in the next class. I'll just briefly touch upon two mathematical outcomes of it. This discussion will take a long time, and I'll discuss it in the next class. But I'll just touch upon these two consequences. Divergence of E. E is zero, therefore rho is equal to zero. Divergence of E is equal to rho by epsilon. And second thing. If E is zero inside a conductor, there is equipotential conduct condition. Potential is the same everywhere inside a conductor. Just now I said, you'll say, what are you saying, sir? Just a while ago, I, I said that there is a potential difference must be created. But then if electric field is zero, then the potential difference will not be there. E is equal to negative gradient of a potential function. If E is equal to zero, then the negative gradient, this must be a constant scalar thing whose differentiation will give you zero. V is constant. So E is equal to zero, V is constant. So inside a conductor, potential is the same everywhere. Inside a conductor, charge density is zero. And this is all happening because E is equal to zero inside a conductor. In the next class, on Friday, we will discuss this thing in greater detail. OK, so I shall stop the sharing now. I shall also stop the recording. If you have any questions to ask, you may do so. Otherwise, we are to meet at 2 PM, where we shall first discuss the exam questions. That is the priority thing, exam solutions. After